and welcome back for our final session of this conference. Please welcome Webster University's president, Dr. Julian Schuster, to introduce our next presenter. Thank you, Vincent, and thank you, everybody, who is still present here. It was a long two days, but I do believe that uh, we do have an extremely interesting, impactful, and relevant panel uh, in front of us. It will be moderated by our associate dean in the School of Education and director of the Teaching English as a Second Language program, uh, DJ Kaiser. Uh, this session is important because it will bring a lot of things which you have together, a lot of things which we all have heard uh, in the past two days. And let me start, you know, with a, with a little, little thing, you know, personal, because I you, you obviously know by the title of the, of, the, of, the, of the panel and by hearing me, you know, why Vincent and Beth thought that I would be a good person to do, to do this, you know. My friend, you know, Chris Parr would be probably a better person because he has a worse accent than I do. <laughs> and that is, the point, that is the point which I wanted to make. You know, we separate, we, it, is, it is in the human nature, and I think Beth and I talked about that on a numerous occasion, how human beings do have those boxes in which they try to put people. And those boxes are binary. Tall is better than short. Fair is better than dark. Slim is preferable to something else. Then, of course, you know, having hair is better than not having it. Finally, and I'm coming to this, there are so many separators, but people who speak English are smarter than people who don't. That is how generations of people are brought up. Then if you go further, there is a proper way to speak English and then there are people with accents. Then you go even further. Some accents are more acceptable than the other accents. And the root of the issue there is that we need to ask ourselves why. Not about accents, but why those separators exist. Today, thanks to the DJ, who is an utmost expert on the field, in, the, in this field, in this area, we will try to learn why in this particular instance people are more prone to accept certain accents than the other accents. Why some languages sound like barbar, barbarian, and the other languages are so welcomed and so pleasing to our ears. All of those things separate us rather than unite us. And what is a common goal of this conference is that diversity needs to create more equity and more equity will result in more inclusion. So allow me to introduce you to you, our, our presenter today, and as I said, my dear colleague, DJ Kaiser. Thank you. Thank you very much for that great introduction that's very much on topic with what I'm going to be talking about today. So um, I'll be focusing a lot on the slides. There are, there are particular details that I want to make sure that we can get through this. Uh, so just to give you a quick overview, uh, I want to talk about linguistic diversity and focusing more on the diversity of English language speakers. Uh, that is the field that I have primarily been working in. Uh, President Schuster has already brought this up, this dichotomy between uh, native and non-native speakers. So we'll also be talking about this concept. 
And then what does it mean to have an accent? But then I also want us to talk about what does it mean to be a good listener? And that's something that we can all learn about here. So I want you to consider the following. Uh, if we had more time, I would put you in groups and have you ask these questions. Uh, so what is an accent, just to start out? Who has an accent? It's one of the things we'll kind of look at. And then when communication breaks down or there are difficulties that are due to a perceived accent, who has the responsibility for changing? So I want you to think about that as we go through this. So some major points. First of all, I want to let everyone know everyone has an accent. So let's just make that clear. So congratulations, you have an accent, you have an accent, you have an accent, I have an accent. We all have an accent. Everyone who's uh, tuned in online, you have an accent. Congratulations. Enjoy it. Celebrate it. If communication breaks down because of an accent, the listener also has responsibilities. This is another very important point for us to discuss. And we'll take a look at some studies that look at this also. And too often what happens is we place this burden of intelligibility on the speaker. And that burden oftentimes increases when the speaker is viewed as foreign or is a racial or ethnic minority. So let's get into this topic of everyone has an accent. And there's a story that I like to start with when I talk about this. So uh, back in 2000, I was a visiting professor at the University of Barcelona, uh, teaching in the English department. I had a very large class, uh, a few large classes, uh, 90 students. And they said, you're going to be reading the listening passage because you're a native speaker. And they will listen to you, and it will test their listening comprehension. So I got into the classroom, and the students all started to complain because they couldn't understand my accent. It was an accent that they were not accustomed to hearing before, being in Europe. And they were concerned that my accent was going to hurt their grade in the end. So I always like to share this story just to contextualize it. Um, because some of the things we're going to look at today is these concepts of the native speaker, ownership of the English language, and the ideal speaker. And these are relative terms, and they're also based a lot on context. So I'm going to take you through a bit of a literature review. And the reason for this is there's some important theories and concepts from applied linguistics and other related fields that will help us build uh, a language that we can use to talk about this. We're also going to look at some research. And this research is going to show us how, why it's important that we be explicit and purposeful about linguistic diversity. So first of all, let's talk about conceptualizing standard English. And I have standard here in quotes. You're going to see a lot of words that I have in quotes. When they're in quotes, I want us to think about what these mean. We may use them every day, but at least for the next half an hour, 45 minutes, I want you to think about these terms, what they mean, why we've used them, how we've used them, and are these accurate terms. So when we talk about the ownership of the English language, a few authors I like to look at. One is Robert Philipson. Uh, he examines the historical role of the United Kingdom and the United States in what he calls linguistic imperialism. And his book from 1992 is called Linguistic Imperialism. Uh, another great author coming from Australia, Alistair Pennycook, uh, explores how uh, colonialism is embedded in the discourses of the English language and in English language teaching. And so this history uh, causes some of these issues that we're going to look at that affect us today. Then we get this concept of the native speaker. So what does that mean to be a native speaker? And Claire Cramps actually challenges this simplistic dichotomy between native speaker and non-native speaker. And then you get to someone like Jennifer Jenkins with her book, The Phonology of English as an International Language. Uh, I would call it a landmark book where she abandons the term native speaker altogether and proposes new terms of monolingual English speaker, bilingual English speaker, and then non-bilingual English speakers. 
and a non-bilingual English speaker for her is a bilingual in two non-English languages who knows some English but does not necessarily care to become as fluent in it as others may expect. So those are her three categories. The important thing is we do have authors who are debating these terms of native speaker. This then leads to this concept of native speakerism. So Adrian Holliday looks at this in uh, the field of English language teaching, ELT, uh, where he notes an established belief that native speaker teachers represent a Western culture from which spring the ideals of both the English language and the English language teaching methodologies. So as we can talk about sexism and racism, heterosexism, we can also talk about native speakerism as another type of discrimination or prejudice that goes on. So looking at English today, one of my favorite authors to look at is David Crystal, wrote this book, English as a Global Language, first came out in 1997, a second edition in 2003, not gotten another edition yet, but looking at his statistics from 1999, uh, he noted that the world population broke six billion, and he estimated that one in four people in the world could communicate in English. That's pretty amazing. A quarter of the world population can communicate in English. But then he further estimated that this non-native English speaker to native speaker, uh, if we compare them, that non-native English speakers outnumber native, speaker, native speakers three to one. That's important for us to keep in mind as we look at English in the world today and who's speaking it. So uh, as we look at this, uh, another great model, Braj Khatru, originally from India, uh, worked at the University of Illinois, uh, proposed this model of world Englishes, and this is purposefully plural, world Englishes. And this model gets, um, this model is uh, cited very often, there's a whole journal now that's called World Englishes, and he hypothesizes these three concentric circles. And so I wanna take you through this just very quickly, these three concentric circles. The center one, the inner circle, are, uh, includes the United Kingdom, the United States, Canada, Australia. These are countries that historically have been considered English-speaking nations. Then he looks at the outer circle, and if you look at this, we've got India, Singapore, Ghana is going to fit into this outer circle. These are former British colonies where English was introduced and is still used in these countries, yet these countries and speakers from these countries are often not considered, quote unquote, native speakers. They are pushed outside of this inner circle. Then we get this expanding circle, which is the rest of the world. So everywhere else where English is being learned. So Uzbekistan, China, Japan, these are countries where English is being learned and taught and used. So we get these three circles, but if we look, where do all those speakers of English fit into this in terms of numbers? So the other thing, so this previous slide with uh, the three concentric circles, you will see this cited a lot. People use this quite often. What people often don't cite or don't talk about from Katru's article is this ontological approach to English. And I know that's gonna be a complex thing to look at, this ontological approach. So how do we view the English language? And he looks at these two different ways. So he's got the nativist monomodel and the functional polymodel. So let me break this down. The nativist monomodel Mono meaning one, there's one model of the English language, and it's based on native speakers. So Katra is saying there's this traditional view of the English language that is a single view that's based on native speakers. But what Katru is trying to propose for us to look at is this functional poly model. There's no one single model. There are multiple models of the English language, and what matters is does the English language function? Are we able to do what we need to do with the English language? So this is the direction that he's trying to take us. So taking Katru's 
statistics and David Crystal's statistics, I then took a look at Jennifer Jenkins' work, and she started looking at uh, what is considered standard English pronunciation. So my background is pronunciation training, so this is something that interests me. Uh, she estimates that only 3% of the population in the United Kingdom speak, receive pronunciation, the Queen's English. And that in the United States and Canada combined, so North America, only 33% speak general American as their variety of English. So if I do some estimates, that would mean approximately 14% of English speakers in the world speak a quote unquote standard variety and that percentage is going to be shrinking each year. So let's take a look at this in a pie chart, because everything looks better in a pie chart when we're talking about numbers. And so me, I'm, I'm seen as a native speaker, I would be in this blue, smaller piece, and the majority of speakers will fit into this larger piece. This is important to keep in mind as we think about using English and communication. So now let's talk about another topic of Accent reduction, this term accent reduction. I did a Google search uh, for these terms, accent reduction, erase your accent, get rid of your accent. And these terms come up a lot. And if we just take a look here, so we've got accent reduction class, speak natural English. And here's my favorite one, the third one, seven accent reduction tips to sound like a real American, real capitalized there. Think about what message this is sending. So let's start to break this down of what this means is accent reduction. So first of all, accent reduction is a myth. It doesn't exist. And there are a lot of scholars out there who are researching this. There's nothing to reduce. You can't get rid of something. You can't erase it. In order to do that, that means that there is a pure accent that is natural, that should be there, and then an accent is something that's on top of it that shouldn't be there that you then have to get rid of. So conceptually, this doesn't really exist. Now one can acquire a new language, can acquire a new set of pronunciation features, but that's different. But the language that we use to talk about accent is not done in that way. We talk about accent reduction. And so this word accent becomes this negative term. So this discourse of accent and this whole idea of accentedness, it is most often associated with people who are considered to be foreign. So these kind of go together. So we said before, everyone has an accent, but we only, in society, will label particular people as having an accent. And when we do that, it's usually us saying that they're foreign. So these tend to go together in our discourse. And what happens is then greater responsibility is placed on non-native speakers to conform or to change the way that they speak. Even though, if we look at statistics, they're the majority of speakers in the world. So just think about that. Okay. So now let's get back to standard English. And now I've got standard English together in quotes and what this means. So when I work with students on this, I always go to Rosina Lippi-Green. Lippi uh, she's one of my favorite people to write on this. And so I've got a quote that I'm going to read, uh, a full, it's two slides. So work with me here. Uh, in critical language studies, ideology is taken as the promotion of the needs and interests of a dominant group or class at the expense of marginalized groups by means of disinformation and misrepresentation of those marginalized groups. More specifically, when looking at the larger issue of language standardization, linguists often refer to a standard language ideology. That is a bias, and I've underlined bias, toward an abstracted, idealized, non-varying spoken language that is imposed and maintained by dominant institutions. And then she finishes here, of course, everyone speaks a dialect and a uniform language is an impossibility. So she's saying everyone has a dialect, I'm saying everyone has an accent. 
we're saying we're speaking the same language here. So if we look at Lippy Green, this formula for a standard language is essentially dominant group, predominantly white, and upper middle class. And together, this becomes our concept of and what determines standard English. This becomes an issue, especially when we start looking at some of the research that's out there. So let's start to apply this to communication today. So in 1964, we had the Civil Rights Act, or the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, Lippy Green, writing about this, notes that you actually can legally fire someone based on accent. And the way she puts this is, an adverse employment decision may be predicated upon an individual's accent when, but only when, it interferes materially with job performance. So now the question is, who determines this? And how does this get determined? And then are those determinations fair? So now let's start to look at some of this research and some of the implications for this. So in classrooms and in professional settings, some of these implications are we may have teachers and administrators who end up catering to the linguistic prejudices of the dominant class. And this is done by expecting that English language learners and African Americans all speak an intelligible art or articulate standard variety of English. This is where a lot of different biases and prejudices come in to play. And in some cases, learners and employees are even expected to give up their home language patterns. Home language patterns, a very important um, way of talking about this, if you look at the Oakland School Board Resolution of 1996, home language patterns was a key phrase that was used in that. So the message that's being sent is you can look different, but you cannot sound different. This is what I'm trying to talk about with linguistic diversity. So we're telling people it's OK to look different, but you're not allowed to sound different. We heard earlier talking about uh, assimilation. And many people are expected to assimilate in terms of language. So now let's start to look at research and see what some of the research says on this. Stephanie Lindman uh, was writing about good communication. She looked at two main things to look at. One is a collaborative approach. And so as we think in terms of a proactive, what are things that we can all do, is if we approach communication with this collaborative approach, that will help. And then the other is mutual responsibility. If there's one thing that you take from this, please let it be this, this aspect of mutual responsibility, that we all share the responsibility together when it comes to communication and understanding each other. The issue, though, is listeners will often not accept the burden of collaboration or responsibility in communication if the speaker is not of the dominant class. So if the speaker is an immigrant or if the speaker is not white, then a listener has a tendency to not take on that mutual responsibility. They say, no, that's your responsibility. So there was an experiment that Donald Rubin did in 1992. Donald Rubin got one person to record a short lecture and play it for undergraduate students. The same lecture was played to two different groups of students. One group was shown the picture of an Asian woman. The other was shown the picture of a white woman. These were not the photos that were used, but in the study, they made sure that the women's hair was the same, they were dressed the same way, they made everything as similar as possible. The only thing that was different was the race that was visual for the listeners in this activity. And then they gave them a test to see how well they understood the content and asked them to rate the speaker in terms of how well they did, uh, in terms of being a presenter speaker. So Ruben found that undergraduate American students had poor performance on a test, 
and rated the instructor as weaker when they perceived that she had an accent based on the visual cue of who they thought that the speaker was. Now, all students heard the exact same voice. She was from Ohio. She was a quote-unquote native speaker. The only difference was the photo that they saw. Other studies that have been done. Wheeler, Cartwright, and Swords did research on elementary school teachers. And what they found is that elementary school teachers were coding dialect differences in pronunciation of African American students as language errors. So, if a young reader says the student asked a question, that would be coded as an error. But my question would be, what if someone from my family was reading and said, the student washed the clothes? Would that be coded as an error that says, this reader doesn't understand this word? And so when perceptions about race and about accent and about communication come in, and it is coded for tracking readers at an early age, this can have very negative effects. And that's what Wheeler, Cartwright, and Swords were looking at. Going back to Lindemann's work, she was looking at native speakers' attitudes and how their attitudes towards non-native speakers affected how successfully they judge communication in the completion of a task. So first of all, looking at what is your attitude towards non-native speakers, if you have a, a good attitude, you viewed that these speakers were contributing and doing a good job. If you have a negative view of non-native speakers, then you would say, no, they, they're, just, they're not doing a good job, and you don't give them credit for what they're doing. Some more studies. Monroe and Derwing, they found no correlation between accent and intelligibility. So they had people say, well, yes, this person has an accent, I can't understand them, but then they pushed them to say, can you transcribe what they wrote? You know what? They could write down the words that they heard. They said, I can't understand because there's an accent, but then when push comes to shove, they could write the words down. That says something a little bit different. And then King and Rubin, so this is Rubin from Donald Rubin, the study we looked at before, uh, found that when native speaking students had taken linguistic coursework, so I love this, my background linguistics, and had meaningful experiences with non-native speakers, their attitudes were more positive and they understood more. That's an important thing. So meaningful experiences. So yesterday, Reverend Tracy Blackman talked about relationships and how relationships, meaningful relationships can transform you if we have those same kinds of relationships with quote unquote non-native speakers, people who speak varieties other than the ones we're familiar with, it will raise our, we'll have a more positive attitude and we will understand more. These are the benefits. So now let's talk about what can we do. So in today's classrooms, we talk about helping all students be college and career ready in our K through 12 schools. Most universities have a focus on global citizenship, like here at Webster University. Yay! So here's the big non-negotiable. All learners must be prepared to use English with a wide variety of English speakers, and this means speaking and understanding. So it doesn't matter if I have a variety of English that more people can understand. What matters is that I also teach myself and prepare myself to understand a wider variety of Englishes in the world. That makes me a better English speaker. In the business world, so we've got competitive business approaches. Oftentimes we are catering to uh, customers. What happens though is this can result in exclusion of linguistically and diverse voices. We need to remember all customers, all clients, all colleagues are valuable. And so looking at linguistic diversity is also an important part of this. So now we start to look at who has the burden when it comes to this. 
So traditional neoliberal approaches will place this burden on the speaker to acquire a native accent or a near native sounding standard English fluency in order to be considered a part of today's market society. Now if we take a look at critical theory, so pulling from critical race theory, uh, critical applied linguistics, uh, so we've got Alistair Pennycook again from uh, Australia, he calls critical applied linguistics, uh, applied linguistics with an attitude. And note here with critical race theory, this citation is from 1995. Uh, so people who believe that critical race theory is something that's brand new that's come out, it's been around for many decades um, and has been an important part of education. Um, so from this critical perspective, we would be seeking to empower all learners. And I believe that that is what it means to be a good educator. So education for non-native and uh, quote-unquote non-standard speakers. Uh, and again, I put these in quotes because we need to question these terms that have become normalized. We need to, um, so for English language learners and African-American English speakers, they need opportunities to develop their individual and community linguistic expressions and it, for their home variety, home varieties, and also understand the power, drawbacks, advantages, and implications of acquiring standard English language patterns. So it's not just this normative, everyone has to speak this way. This is going to be a different kind of approach. So there's a lot more um, research out there in how we can do this for culturally and linguistically diverse learners. So helping learners develop both home varieties and a standard variety to provide learners with strong metacognitive skills. These metacognitive skills, your ability to understand the differences between your home variety, your home language, and then this language expectation that's in the classroom or in a textbook can help you be more of a critical uh, user of language. And it can also help you navigate your own linguistic expression. And the goal is to help you navigate linguistic expression in a world that includes prejudice, struggles, and inequality. One of the authors I love looking at is Suresh Kanagaraja. He talks about code meshing. So some of you may have heard of code switching. So code switching is when you uh, view two different languages or two different varieties and you treat them as two separate languages or two separate varieties. And so you switch between one or the other. Maybe it's based on context or within the same message. Kanagaraja talks about code meshing. So he specifically looks at African-American scholars who are told this is the only way that you can write in order to get ahead and looking at African-American scholars who do code meshing where they say, this is how I speak in my community. It's part of my identity. And then this is part of the language that is used in the academy and I'm going to mesh them together and infuse them so that you see my identity and see how I am contributing to my field because I can't pull them apart. So Kanagaraja, great author to look at for that. Um, so you see here at the bottom, translanguaging. This is another uh, big concept that's in the last 10 years, especially in the last five years, we're hearing discussed a lot more in K through 12 schools. As we look at English language learners, this includes opportunities for bilingual education to promote literacy and access to content in both the home language and then in the standard English that is needed for, uh, for tests that uh, are used in schools. It's a reality that we have, and that's a whole other topic we could get into. An important thing here is that teachers need to stop denigrating students for speaking their home language at school. So if a teacher says, we don't speak Spanish at school, that's only spoken at home, no Arabic on the playground, you can only speak that at home, 
That's not good for students. And as we look at translanguaging, it takes a different approach, and it's a repertoire approach. The repertoire approach looks at all of the linguistic resources that you have, including your home language or home languages, and views them all as assets and all as promoting, and any way that you use parts of your repertoire in order to make yourself understood is positive. And that goal then is to use that repertoire as we are developing the language skills that we are learning within school. But with this, then, all teachers must be prepared to work with English language learners. So then if we look at African American English speakers, what this looks like is having districts explore bidialectal approaches to language that celebrate difference and promote metacognitive skills and code switching. So if we go back to 1996, the Oakland School Board Resolution, uh, Ebonics, uh, so they defined the home language patterns of students in the Oakland School District uh, as Ebonics, as a separate language, in order to apply for bilingual education funds from the federal government. And using a new approach, and uh, if you lived around at that time, the media really got things wrong. Uh, if you want to know about the, more about this, let me know. We could talk about this. It's one of these topics I love talking about, but we don't have time for it here. Other important things here is teachers must stop demanding students to speak, and I put this in quotes very purposefully, proper, and need to recognize that they are doing more harm than good when asking students to speak, quote unquote, proper English because of the message that that sends to learners. And states and universities must require all teachers to prepare, to be prepared to meet the needs of African American English speakers in today's schools. As I look at what the requirements are to become certified as a teacher in Missouri, I do not see this as a requirement. This is not an explicit requirement. It is folded into diversity and, expect, and accepting all learners. That's not the same. There is research out there. There are explicit things that can be done, research uh, that can facilitate language learning and ensuring that we respect the linguistic diversity of our learners. Then education for all learners. I believe that all learners, no matter what your variety, including native speakers who speak quote unquote standard English, they need meaningful exposure to multiple varieties of English and speakers of diverse, linguist background, of diverse linguistic backgrounds. What this does is it helps combat negative attitudes and develops positive attitudes. We saw that from the research that this is an important piece. It helps them learn strategies to promote mutual responsibility and all communication. We all need to play our role with that responsibility. It also increases learners' ability to bend their ears to understand more accents, dialects, and varieties. So um, I went to Barcelona when I was 16 years old, and then I was a student there uh, for a year, and then I went back and I was a faculty member there. So I learned to speak Spanish, and then I got to Uruguay to do my Fulbright, and I found I don't understand people, but I, I, I mean, I've taught Spanish, I'm a Spanish speaker, what's happening here? So what I did was I turned on the TV and I listened to as much Uruguayan Spanish as possible to bend my ear. It was my responsibility to bend my ear and to become familiar with a different variety. We can do this with English. We can do this with any language that we speak. So with this, all learners must be prepared to interact with, work with, and learn from the 86% estimated English speakers in the world who do not speak a quote unquote standard variety of English. We also need to promote a critical understanding of language choice and language use, and with that, that we are respecting identity, community affiliations, individual agency, and mutual respect. This is why this is so important. For teacher educators, 
We should be embedding different quote unquote accented and non-standard varieties and other diverse language texts into teacher preparation courses so that our teachers are prepared for this. We should promote meaningful ways to actively work to understand the diversity of Englishes that are spoken in the United States and in the world. What I like doing is going to TED Talks. It is a simple place to go because they have so many diverse speakers. And when I talk to teachers, and often when I talk to teachers, it is a group of predominantly white teachers. I say, when I'm a teacher, I'm white, and this is the variety that I speak. People already understand this, so I need to bring in other varieties, other speakers. This is what's going to help all of our learners. We can do this, and TED Talks is such an easy place to go. There are many other places that we can go to look for more varieties. Also for teacher educators, uh, education professors must include both theoretical and research-based practice articles on working with culturally and linguistically diverse learners. So I've presented some of those here today. And education professors must address specific strategies for working with, and not just working with, but empowering English language learners and African American English speakers in today's classrooms. So with classroom teachers, if we include multiple varieties of English in our classroom materials, this will greatly help. We need to make sure that we're respecting home language skills that students bring and treat these as an asset. Too often in classrooms, they're treated as something that hold back from the learning rather than being a part of the learning and an asset. We also need to help students develop a critical understanding of these varieties and how to select and mix varieties based on context, purpose, and audience. So this means we don't say this is the one and only way that we all have to speak so that we're all on the same page because that's just not how the world works. We come from different backgrounds and that's important. And as we look at diversity, equity, and inclusion, this is a central part of that work. With school administrators, when hiring, seek to actively promote linguistic diversity with your teachers and with your support staff. And if you get complaints then from people from, um, for, who, from people who say, I can't understand so-and-so, don't cater to those prejudices. Make sure that you talk about how important it is to have these diverse voices and that is actually helping all learners. We need to hear these different voices. If I only hear Midwestern standard style English, that's all that I will be able to understand. That's not the world that we live in. That's not the world that we're going to be working in. And we are doing harm. And we need to make sure that we let parents know that in these situations. In professional contexts, Please, please, please remove native speaker preferred from job postings. There are studies that are on this. I'm in the field of English language teaching. There are actual job postings, and I see these, and I get these job postings. People contact me and say, hey, you direct this program. You've got graduates. Can you send this out to your graduates? And I call them up, and I say, no, I can't, and this is why I can't, and let's have a conversation about this. It's very important to look at this and not just send it out. Don't cater to these preferences. Preferences is what I hear. There's prejudices um, for standard English. And avoid the tendency of selecting speakers of standard varieties for public speaking or public facing activities. So if we only select people who have the preferred accents, that sends a, a particular message. We need to include all of these voices when we are selecting people for public-facing and customer-facing activities. We also need to support culturally and linguistically diverse workers as they encounter prejudices focused on their variety of English. We need to be prepared for this. We need to help develop strategies for all employees so that they are promoting mutual responsibility and communication. And we need to recognize that some employees may need additional support to develop additional strategies based on how they will be perceived by 
people that they are working with. Advocacy, again, is, is, it will also be an, an important part of our work. Remember that as we advocate for culturally and linguistically diverse learners, we also need to advocate for their voices. So not just for people, but also for their voices. These quote-unquote accented voices, these quote-unquote non-standard varieties, this is all part of this diversity. And remember that promoting diverse voices ultimately benefits everyone. I cannot stress this enough. I have been blessed with a career of working with culturally and linguistically diverse learners and using English all around the world where they don't always understand me and I have to work to make myself understood. And at first I don't understand them, but once I do, it makes it easier for me in that next context. This can help all of us. Your ear will bend, trust me. So coming full circle, so just like my students in Barcelona, in the end, they had no trouble understanding me. They heard me every week in class, and so they, they bent their ears, they learned this new variety, they expanded their horizons of the English language. If we do this for all of our learners with a variety of different accents and varieties and dialects, this will also benefit all of our learners. So when we come back to the concept of diversity, equity, inclusion, I want you to think about not only what it looks like, but also what it sounds like. And so we need to include diverse voices, and we need to find ways to purposefully include these diverse voices. Uh, if you like, uh, I did write a piece about this on Medium. It's called Everyone Has an Accent. That means everyone, the harmful discourse of accent reduction and accented speech. Uh, it's on Medium. Uh, it is the less academic version of this. So today I did go more academic, uh, citing particular studies. Uh, so if you want a lighter read, uh, oddly enough, this, this article has been read quite a bit. And um, so uh, get the reads up for it. Um, uh, so I've got the uh, URL there for you. And then I also have my references here. Uh, and so we can find a way to get those out to people. But that takes us to... Um, the end, and I think then we get to questions. Let's see how we did on time. Hi, DJ. Hello. So first of all, I want to say thank you for including this in the conference, because I think it's overlooked way too often. Um, so as a child, I was born in Texas moved to Germany, was there for six years, and then lived on the East Coast for about seven years. So when I got here to Missouri and started in high school, the English teacher that I had told me I had a speech impediment. But it was truly just because she couldn't understand my accent. When I'm tired, the country comes out, and so I've worked really hard to talk like this. <laughs> And it was really worse for my sister because she was older. And it's come full circle now because my youngest, my husband is from St. Kitts in the Caribbean. And so my youngest was in first grade and started, you know, speaking some of my husband's dialect and was told that he had a speech impediment. And so when I went up to the school to talk with them, we found out that's what it was. So instead of putting him in a special class to get help, we talked with him about this. So now I'm, he's in high school and I'm on the board and this information that you've shared really needs to be shared with them. They've done a great job with um, not saying don't speak Spanish or you know, those kind of things, but they completely leave everything else out. So I appreciate this topic. Thank you for sharing your story. Other questions? We'll see if there are questions online. Okay. And we're waiting just a moment. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. And again, I also following your direction, what you're talking, I'm really glad that this has been really valued here at Webster. Uh, and you guys trying to bring it up, this, the language and the accents. 
Um, and bringing back to what we discussed yesterday with the uh, arrangement, let's say, for, <laughs> for students with disability. Mm -hmm. um, when I was a student here at Webster, got my master, it was, um, let's say, it took me three times as long to get my assignments done mm -hmm. as a native speaker, and that was kind of, a, couldn't say much, it was like a, a master's degree that I got here. But uh, are we addressing that also as maybe giving your students here um, an arrangement if you are not an, a native speaker? So, good. so uh, let me see if I am understanding what you're talking about. So with, with international students, students who, who come to study in the United States or an English-speaking nation where they've studied in another language before, they may need additional time, additional support, mm -hmm. and that is part of English as a second language, English for academic purposes. So these are things that definitely we need to do. Because uh, today I was focused more specifically on accent and in terms of pronunciation. But we also have to recognize that there are other differences in terms of grammatical differences, learning enough of the vocabulary. The English language is very complex when it comes to vocabulary. We've got a very large vocabulary. The English grammar system is very particular. Spelling is something I'm still trying to master because it just doesn't make sense. <laughs> and there are historical reasons for that, and that would be another hour-long lecture. Um, so yes, thank you for bringing that up. Does that, does that answer your question? Thank you. So we've got an online question here. So how do you compare standard English with all the US accents? For example, y'all. So this is a really great question. Thank you for this question. So yes, there is a lot of uh, diversity in terms of what we consider standard English. But I think the important thing to keep in mind is uh, where we draw the border of what is considered standard and what is not considered standard. And very often, standard is defined more by what we say it is not. So <clears throat> if and I'm just going to come down to race. If, if white people commonly say y'all, well then we're going to consider that to be standard English. But if someone who's not white uses a certain word or structure, then that will fall on the outside. But these are all lines that we're drawing. They're all ideological and they are socially constructed and socially constructed through history and power. And these are very important things to keep in mind, this whole idea of standard and how we define that. Um, so I've got a question here. Do you find any connection to difficulty in understanding non-native speakers for students uh, on the spectrum for learning differences tied to their learning difference versus not enough experience in learning Mutual responsibility. Um, so you find the difficulty in understanding non-native speakers. So with this, I, I, I think I would want to know with on the spectrum, are we talking about on the autism spectrum here, or are we talking about on a spectrum of language learning? Because these will all be different things to be looking at. Um, I think with all of these, it comes down to the, uh, the exposure that we get and learning to under, uh, the more that we hear different voices. So for example, um, I remember with my niece when she was young, I had trouble understanding her, but then my brother and his wife understood her because they heard her all the time and I wasn't around her all the time. So this is a pattern of language that I'm not as accustomed to hearing. And so I had to work with my ear to do that. I think when it comes to non-native speakers and then any other types of differences in communication. So if we look at, uh, so we had uh, the concept of speech impediment of, is there a speech impediment or not? Um, when uh, that may be there, the more familiarity we have with it, 
the better job that we can do with understanding it. But it really comes down to uh, being exposed to that. And I've found that the more that we're exposed, exposed to speakers from particular languages, the more that it helps. Because once you're able to identify a language community, it may help you understand what a particular word is. Uh, So here, are you aware of the National Council of Teachers of English 1974 resolution on students' rights to their own language? I'm struck by the fact that it's nearly 50 years old. How could this resolution be used to support linguistic diversity in the classroom? Ooh, I love this. This is great. Um, so yes, I, I, it's, so we can have resolutions. We can make statements. Uh, so the panel before uh, was talking about uh, we can have conversations, but when does it become action? And that we need to get to that action stage. And I think this is what we need to do with uh, languages in, in the classroom and how we address language is how we get to that um, action stage. That's okay. Uh, let's see, do you find that people learn their way of speaking from the environment they grew up in? And sometimes people don't believe they are who they are when meeting a person after a phone conversation. OK. Uh, so the, 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 there seem to be some different, um, some different things that are going on here. So, um, so yes, uh, language is language we learn through social interaction. That's just that's how we learn it. So we acquire the language that we hear, that variety that we hear. And uh, different ages, different formative ages will play a role then in how we speak that language. So that's going to become one key thing there. Uh, so I would definitely say that environment does play a role. So, and then sometimes people don't believe they are who they are when meeting in person after a phone conversation. Ooh, so um, there's some great research. Um, and I'm going to Blake on his name right now, of course, aren't I? Um, on linguistic discrimination. And, uh, yes, thank you. Yes, at Wash U. Um, and so he did research where, uh, so he was from the Oakland area, and he would call for uh, housing. So he would look to see what housing was available, and he would call using an African American accent. And then he would call using a Hispanic accent, and then he would call using what's considered a standard American accent. Uh, and he's African American. And living in Oakland, he was surrounded by these different varieties and learned to, uh, to do all three of these. And then he would take a record of who would call back in terms of the house, of, of the rental property, of was it available or not. So if he spoke the standard American English, he would get a call back, but using what was considered African American English or Hispanic English would not get calls back as often. Uh, and so that comes down to the different perceptions that people bring to that. Uh, and then with this, sometimes people don't believe who they are uh, when they're meeting in person. Uh, this broke my heart. I was at a conference and someone was doing a, um, she was presenting on World Englishes, Braj Khatri's work. And she said she did a phone interview and she got the job and she showed up and they said, I'm sorry, there, there must be a mistake. We can't hire you. She was Indian. And on the phone, she was fine. But when they saw her in person, they rescinded the job offer. And I, that broke my heart to hear that. But this is a reality that people go through. So that is something that will happen. People make assumptions based on what they hear. And racial assumptions are made based on that. 
I've got a happier story for you, and I'll tell it in the accent that um, President Schuster referred to just uh, in his introduction. It's a little self-congratulatory towards Webster University, but I think my colleagues will like to hear that. Um, years ago, teaching in Leiden in Holland, I um, was teaching quite a large class there of students. Um, I think at one point I counted there were 22 students in the class and 28 passports in the class, right? So there are a lot of range of things. And one of the young men in that class who took a couple more with me, became I became friends with him. I house at his house at one point. And he got a very good job out of Webster, after Webster University in ING Bank, ING Bank. And he found himself in a meeting on regularly on Monday mornings with about eight colleagues, all Dutch, who were talking to ING bank representatives all around the world. So there'd be German, Russian, um, Korean, Japanese, uh, Chinese, Malaysian, Indian, uh, maybe a couple of Africans, so forth, right? So big team thing. And he said he noticed something very interesting. His Dutch friends, who had been raised with the Dutch assumption that there are correct ways to speak Dutch and all the other ways are wrong, sort of had the same view of English. And so they would spend quite a bit of time in the meeting kind of laughing behind the backs of the, of the foreign speakers from all around the world on their, on their big conference call. Whereas he'd been in Webster University classes at Leiden and been used to this very big range of ways of speaking, both between, non -nat between native speakers like myself and non-native speakers like the Dutch students and you know, Asians and, and Africans and others. And he said he'd learned from being in class at Webster a really different attitude, the attitude of letting people speak the way they speak and making sense of that. And I think it goes back very much to the points you were making, DJ, very helpfully about what's required in business these days and also that our educational environments need to create spaces for students to become familiar with linguistic differences and different accents, not just from the front of the classroom, but among their own um, fellow um, classmates and so forth. And I'd be interested to know what you'd have to say to that example. Uh, yes, uh, they're definitely in different countries, you'll have different concepts of what is considered understandable for a language, including understandable for English. And I have found that where I'll be in a country and they'll understand other people that are from that country speaking English and then from particular uh, English speaking nations, but then other people, they'll say, well, this person I can't understand. Yes. Even though they're interacting with a majority of quote unquote non-native speakers. Uh, yeah, thank you for sharing that. That's, that's a good example there. We got one more here. Um, how can, is this concept of linguistic diversity being addressed in elementary and secondary schools, is it being addressed nationally or just locally? This is a really good question. So uh, from what I've seen, this is not a requirement for education to specifically address understanding a greater variety of Englishes. Uh, I've not seen this as policy. So anything that is being done, it, so, uh, so is it being done? It depends on individual classes. Now, how can it be done? The more that we bring in a variety of different speakers. Uh, so we talk about, so um, Webster has a, a five-year grant from the US Department of Education where we're working with teachers in, to prepare them to work with English language learners. And we work on family, parent, and community engagement. One of the things that we can do is we can leverage parents, family members, and community members that represent diverse voices and bring them in at the earliest ages so that learners are hearing a variety of voices. This is another way that we begin engaging with parents, with family members, with the community, and this is going to support the learning of more of our learners in the classroom. So that's just one thing that comes to my mind that I can think of there. You can just see you now. All right, I'm getting the, it's time to close up. So thank you all very much for coming, especially on such a beautiful day.
Well, just a few remarks as we close out these two days. And I think about when we started just yesterday morning. It is hard to imagine it was just yesterday morning that we began these two days because it has been so rich and full. Um, but as you know, if you were present with us, Bell Hooks was on my mind. Uh, and Bell Hooks saying that educating is a vocation rooted in hopefulness. And with hopefulness, we can see the rich variety of topics and perspectives and voices that we've heard in these two days, not with the lens of, oh my goodness, this is like so complicated and there's so many topics and there's so much to learn, it's hopeless. I, I, I just want to just kind of go back in my little circle that I've drawn around myself and, and just push it all out. Hopefulness, instead, gives us this attitude of inclusion <laughs> and belonging and the recognition that the work that needs to be done is, is our work for me and for all of us. It's not about other people. It's about every single one of us expanding that circle of inclusion. Um, thinking back to the first panel we had yesterday morning, um, and the rabbi saying that you know one of the fundamental uh, principles of most religions is I'm right and the rest of you are wrong, uh, and you could hear that in what Julian said, you know, tall is right, short is wrong, <laughs> you know, hair is right, no hair is wrong, you know, you just go on and on with the list, and and it tends to be quite self-referential, right? Is it I'm right? and the rest of you are wrong. Uh, and if that is the way we approach life in part or in full, uh, then we have really denied the common bond of humanity. And we've heard speaker and speaker again say, it is our shared humanness, the human condition, the, the human challenge and opportunity that gives us the greatest reason to continue being an educational institution that is trying to learn more, do more, and do better. So as you will have opportunity already, I hope, where you've given us some feedback about these sessions, um, and you will get more opportunity to do that, we'll follow up with you. Know that we take your feedback seriously. We'll take it seriously in that we've said this conference is about everyday inclusion right here, right now. And we will not wait until a conference a year from now to use that feedback to figure out what we need to do def differently. Uh, so Julian and she, um, Vincent and I have already been talked about uh, what we can do this spring, uh, so stay tuned. More to come, and we hope that you will be part of the journey because we enjoy learning with you and from you. Thank you very much for being with us these two days. Just not to be repetitive, we had a wonderful two days. And again, thank you for hanging with us uh, till this hour. This is not the end. As you know, as uh, on many uh, Many speakers, many participants said that this is a journey. And yes, indeed, this is a journey. This journey for us started many years ago, but with this conference, it was formalized approximately seven years ago. And we plan to do this for many, many, many more years. Because this is an evolving, evolving topic. This is an evolving phenomenon. The issues which we are dealing today we will be resolving, first here at Webster, then in our family, in our communities, but then certainly in broader context. There will be new issues which will be showing up. And that brings me to the extremely important point with which, which our last presenter, DJ, mentioned. We need to ask ourselves why racism exists, why any type of the ideology exists. It exists in order to subdue one po population and to elevate the smaller group of people 
who will make a decision and take an advantage of that. What we need to do, we need in our own examples, with your help, to slowly but surely put an end on this type of practices wherever we find them. It is not only about individuals, it is about institutions which perpetuate that. It is about our schools, it is about our classrooms, it is about our, and you know where I'm going to end up. We need to speak to each other, but we need to speak to the others as well. We need to be heard, regardless, again, pun intended, of our accents. We need not to be judged by our looks. We need to be diverse, equitable, and inclusive. If you want to learn more, DJ is a as a superb scholar, he already pointed out to his references, you know, and everything else. But we do have a reference list in our library, and we do have sources for all of you who would like to learn a little bit more to go and to see, see those sources in our library. I look forward not only to the next year, but to the next occasion in which we are going to continue this hard but rewarding work of making this world a better place. Thank you. So I would like to thank all of our presenters uh, who gave so graciously and generously of their time, their expertise, um, to join us and to share their knowledge and wisdom with us. I'd like to thank you all uh, those of you who are present with us live and those of you who have tuned in to watch us virtually from around the globe. Of course, this conference could not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors. Because of their support, we are able to offer this conference year after year free of charge and open to the public. And so for that, I say thank you. I'd also like to thank my many colleagues who have also been supportive and have helped uh, collaboratively to make the last two days happen. It looks seamless only because they have worked so incredibly hard. And so if we could give them a round of applause, I would really appreciate it. Our AV team, um, there were several glitches that we had that the viewers probably didn't know that you all jumped right in to make happen perfectly, so thank you. Um, this has been fantastic, and we look forward to seeing you next year here for our eighth annual conference, but as President Schuster said, be tuned, stay tuned. We will have other wonderful opportunities prior to then. So thank you very much, be well, travel safely, and we'll see you soon.